Hello and welcome to our very first episode of HTCG Podcast. I'm Sean Farmer, also known as Xyphine, and today I have three, I guess, special guests with us. If y'all would like to introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Andrew, or Fission Essence. I'm uh, Xavier, or Zalus. And I'm Colin, or Carts. <laughs> and this episode is going to be featuring our, or uh, what makes a successful HTCG. Yeah, what does <laughs> make a successful HTCG? That is the question. That's a really solid question. Yeah. Um. Well, we'll answer it thoroughly today. Yeah, hopefully. Do my best. <laughs> so, for me, I think a successful HTCG relies heavily on the professionalism of it as much as it does the amount of sales. Because uh, if, if you have a game that's not printed and completely just, you know, printer paper printed on like a homemade printer like and stuff like that it's i wouldn't really call that success versus if you have it actually printed from a legit company and everything yeah. i think it really depends on the person like who's making it because arguably one of the most successful uh htcgs is um chaos galaxy yeah. He probably has one of the biggest followings, but his cards aren't exactly anything special. They aren't they aren't um, um they aren't these amazing works of art that do that just stun people looking at it, but he's developed such a community for the game. Yeah. And that's probably what I would consider a success here, creating that community, having people play it. Um and he he just flat out proves your game doesn't have to be like Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh and have hundred dollar pieces of artwork. Even though I did spend hundred dollars of pieces of artwork, but that's not <laughs> important. Um, I just can't draw. That's that's why I do that. Um, well, hundred dollars is cheap. Yeah, depending on the artist and the artwork, it can be. Yeah, cheap. but I do think it's that sense of building the community around your game is what makes the game successful. So just a large following in general? A large following and people actually enjoying it. Like... Mm. That's what I want out of my game. So, with that being said, um, does the following itself create the successful HTCG? Or would, would that entail... If your game is only on something like tabletop simulator, is that still count? You know, counted as an actual successful HTCG, or is it something that people have to play physically? Um, it's that comes down to how you decide to publish your game. That could be a kind of different side of it because it's the goal for I feel like most people making a card game is to get it out there. And to get people to play it. Um, and be, that leads to however you decide to get it out there. I know that you uh, are working on a online version of Demi. And that's kind of one of your main ways to get it out there. Right? Yeah. I don't want to start with an online version of Broken Blades. I want to get it printed because I personally just really prefer physical copies of cards. But mm -hmm. that's a personal preference. I know plenty of people who play card games purely online. And if you look at something like Hearthstone, that's exactly only online. They don't print paper cards. Yeah. It's... I don't think the publishing means technically matters. I think it really is just building that community around your game. And it's and I think, again, another part to it is a community that actually enjoys the game compared to a community that plays the game 
for other reasons because I've met plenty of people who play games to win. It's not about the enjoyment. It's about winning or it's about something else. Yeah, I mean, that could also be how your game's focused. A lot of people try to focus yeah. games more in uh, PvP and stuff. Uh, random question, but is the stream looking good for y'all? Because it keeps freezing for me. I just want to make it's sure it's freezing for me too. Okay, so that is a thing that I need to fix. Open settings. Yeah, I don't I don't know why it it turns it from rectangles to square on my stream. I guess I'll fix that hopefully. For my computer time. just sucks ass and I can't see anything. Oh, oh, that's much better. Never mind. Ah, oh, cool. Okay, it's got it's got me up there now too, except the lack of video. Cuz uh Okay, so y'all think we should restart everything, or just, you know, go from where we were at? I think uh, we should go from where we're at. Okay, cool. We could do that a separate yeah. thing if we want to later on. Alrighty. So, back to the topic at hand of what makes a successful HTCG. What about... Uh, fission and cards. What what what's y'all's opinions on it? Well, I like both those answers so far. I mean, the community is always great to have. Um, and if you got a bunch of people who are excited about your game, it's hard to say that's not a success to some degree. But or you know, you got physical cards in your hand, right? Your card game looks great. Well, that's a success too. Um, but yeah. it, it comes down to the creator, right? Like, what did you want to get out of the game? Because if you got what you wanted, then you your game was a success. So I think it's kind of cheesy, but it could be as simple as, like, I wanted to practice making a game, right? Maybe you didn't put a single thing online. Maybe everything was hand-drawn. Maybe you made 10 cards and scrapped it, but you learned a lot. Well, mm -hmm. then maybe that was a success for you. Um, I mean, nobody else is going to say that it was a successful TCG for them, <laughs> but... If you learned a lot, you know, maybe when you go into your second game, you are, you go in stronger and more knowledgeable and more practiced than, than it was a successful game. That one's cheesy, you know, but, yeah. um, but like in that same kind of spectrum, you could say that your game is successful. Like maybe you just want to put on the Game Crafter and have, you know, a few people buy packs. And I like the community. I like the idea. For me, I think a good benchmark is like you finished. Like, you made a core set, you have some starter decks out, you have rules that it's a game that someone can come in and learn to play from the rules that you've put up. And, like, as though it were any uh, professional game, regardless of your success level or how many sales you've made, if someone can find it and without you teaching them to play, like, they can read to play, buy some cards, and, like, play your game, to me, that's probably what I would call the benchmark of success. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that one. Um, having a fully finished product as well. It was, it was one of the hardest things, at least for me, was making a rule set. And that was like the last thing I created. So mm -hmm. having a game where, yeah, people can just play it without having to ask you, you know, 20 questions. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. What about you, Cards? Well, um, you guys all made very good points. Um, like with the professionalism is uh, getting it to look as professional as you possibly can. Um, I know there's some people in you know different countries, or whatever, that can't uh, can't do that. But always show that you're putting like your full effort into it. Um, also, I'm just trying to think of something that you guys haven't said. Um, being consistent with it. Um, if your game is something that has like sets or you know like additional cards that you add in eventually, I think being consistent with those, like how Magic does with like every like every three months or something like that, they yeah, have a new right set. Now, standard sets in Magic drop every three months right now with auxiliary sets in between. Mm -hmm. 
So like, yeah, like uh, something like that. And uh, like right now, so most uh, HTCGs on uh, like the Game Crafter, for example, um, they have like one set like every year, but at least they're like yeah, and that's being consistent really... with that. On that point, I just want to throw out it. You don't have to do one set every three months. Yeah, Magic yeah, yeah. can do that because they have millions. Wizards <laughs> of the Coast has millions of dollars and hundreds of people working on that game. Like you do, that is not a reasonable benchmark to try to reach, especially if it's you or even just you and a couple of friends working on something. Mm-hmm. That is that is insane. If you get there to that point where you can, because you have the resources for that, that's great. But don't look at it as they do that, so you need to do that because mm-hmm. you'll just tire yourself out, and you're setting unreasonable goals. Yeah, yeah. And consistency like, is really what matters the most. As long as your community and everyone else that's following the game, I guess, knows exactly when, on average, you drop new sets, even if it's, like, you know, once every year, like you mentioned, or once every two years. As long as they know, hey, on X pretty much date, we know that a new new pack will be released. Mm. New card to have fun with. Yeah. Consistency is a good word to take out of that conversation because whether you're working toward your first set being finished or whether you're working on expansion sets or maybe instead of doing full like booster expansion sets, you do like a new structure deck or something with new cards in it every mm-hmm. couple of months. You just have a more manageable single person type of project. Um, anything like that, I think it has the potential to be successful as long as you are consistent. So that's a good word. So, how about uh, sales and profits and stuff? Do y'all do y'all have any opinions on that? And if that has any play in what makes it successful or not? I know you said it all depends on uh, what you want going into it. However, for most people, I would think, you know, seeing the product with lots of sales and stuff would probably be a huge success. So yeah. what, in y'all's opinion, would, you know, deem that to be a success? Well, for me, I would so probably answer your question maybe almost indirectly. But for me personally, I think I would feel more successful less by, like, how much money I made. Um, than like how many people are putting up their own like videos about it. You know, like if other people are getting into the game and doing content, um, I'll probably feel more satisfied than based on the money I'm making. Unless, of course, if my game goes crazy and then like I make I become rich, <laughs> insane <laughs> prospect. At that nice. point, I would have to admit that that would be successful. But um, back in the realm of of actual possibility. Um, I don't expect to make a living off of it, so I wouldn't really I, use that as a reasonable metric. Um, I don't like... Um, I really don't like when people are talking about, like, you know, a creative venture they are doing, and then say something, but then kind of go back and say, well, that's just not possible. It's possible. It really yeah. is. Like, you can. Am I... Am I is it probable? Okay, I will give you that one. It might not be. But you can get there. Like, it's doable, and it's something that I truly believe you can do whatever you want, and you can get to wherever you want. It's just you might have to make choices you don't like, and those might be what stop you, and that's fine. But definitely I don't like the idea of saying you can't. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't mean to say it's impossible, but No, I think no, you're gotta, good. I just you gotta work hard and you be a, a little bit lucky. Yeah. Um in, the, in the game industry. Yeah, with really any type of business, uh luck plays a huge factor, but also dedication and the willingness to I guess promote it in multiple different ways, such as um advertisements if you can somehow save up the funds to do uh an ad on 
really anything large, such as Hulu, for example. Uh, I don't know if they play these type of ads in other countries, but like Mike Bloomberg, uh, not to go political, but he was on everything. Any YouTube video, he had an ad on. Any Hulu video, he had an ad on. You have ads on Pandora, you can guess that he was talking to you in your ear. Like, if you have the funds for it, I th even if you have to save money for it, I think uh, there's there's always a chance that you you can really make a lot of I guess sales and everything. That so way. there's other ways to advertise that are a lot more creative and a lot cheaper. Oh yeah, don't steal my ideas. But <laughs> I'm random down right I'm, now. I'm my plan when I get. Uh, Broken Blade to the point of a Kickstarter is I'm going to print out like 2,000 posters and just ship them to local game stores around the country. Mm, that's pretty nice. That will maybe cost around five to $6,000. And that gives me free advertising in any store that posts it. Conventions are another way. I'm, I mean, I've been, you know, ranting about uh, this convention and one thing I want to do for my next convention is buy a six foot cardboard printout of one of each major god so like Hades uh, Thor and Raw or something so like uh, you can find conventions that are pretty cheap I bought two tables at a local convention for $80 which is oh, really cheap compared to Stuff like E3, which, you know, you can spin upwards of $100,000 just for the tables and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely cheaper alternatives that will guarantee uh, sales and stuff, which, if that's how you view success, could, could do it as well. Um, local car shops is another good one. Yeah, I've gotten, yeah a few people at least interested in asking questions about it and just by going and play testing, you know, there. Um, yeah, I actually plan, I have my local card shop when I can get, uh, hopefully by the end of March, I have everything moved over to the new frame and my plan, I already have people at, who want to do it. Uh, I made my game draftable. So I'm going to have people who draft my game to play test it. Mm -hmm. And not going to lie, that was a lot of extra work because balancing for draft is very yeah. different than balancing for a constructed format. But um, it should add an extra level to my game that also help. That also, yeah, no, just go into your local card shop and doing just pull out your game and if you have a friend who's already with you, play with them. People come over and ask what you're playing because people are curious just yeah. by nature. Um, speaking of the draftable and everything, do y'all do y'all see having multiple different, um, I guess, game like types, formats. game plays, yeah, formats and everything for your card game as a success? For example, I'm making a tabletop version of my game. Um... Like, you know, different stuff like that, such as a draft pick and, um, you know, other other forms of extra playing. I, think I do plan on doing it. I think it helps a lot of the other aspects of success for the game. Okay. Well, there, so there, in my opinion, there's, uh, a risk to making a bunch of game modes, which is that you might fracture the relatively small audience that you're starting out with. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, if you're trying to teach magic to a room full of ten people, and you teach, and three of them love Commander, and four of them love Popper, and five of them, I mean, I, I didn't add it up right, but, you know, some people love yeah. Standard. Well, then now you've got a small group of people who they can't all play with each other. Um, and you've already kind of fractured that small group. That's just a, like a metaphor for you know a new game starting out. Um, you want people to be able to say, hey, do you play this game? And then someone say yes, and then they know how to play with each other. 
which is not always true in Magic with the different formats that exist. It's like, oh, do you do you play Magic? Yeah. Okay, but I play Legacy tournaments, and oh, I only play Draft. Oh, and I only play pre-release. So, um, I think it's great, especially if the community develops it, because that shows that there's already room for the community, and then they're going to be invested in it. A lot of Magic's best formats kind of evolved from the player base rather than Wizards yeah. establishing it. Um, but on the other hand, there are certainly pros to having different formats as well, which is that maybe instead of fracturing a small player base, you are able to reach out to different player bases um, yeah. and bring in more new players than a singular format would have otherwise. And I think part of that is, um, I think everything you said is for completely correct but i think it is safer if you end up doing a constructed format like a standard-esque format but then you also have a limited format because those tend to merge better than the other formats because it's a limited format just a fancy way for people to get new cards and also still play the game yeah i agree um hmm. but yeah now if you like let's say you made magic today and it didn't exist, and you go, we have Commander, we have Legacy, we have Popper, we have Standard, um, Two-Headed Dragon, and you're like, okay, go have fun playing, guys. You would definitely really split up that fan base. Yeah. Because there'll be people who'll go, I really love Commander, and I only want to play Commander. And now you've probably segregated your fan base into five different groups who don't really play together very much. Yeah. And, and actually, um, I'll say that limited play like drafting or sealed deck can be great for play testing as well as i guess you experience is having to draft for that environment is pretty different but it uh in constructed a lot of cards can be passed over very quickly especially if you have like weaker commons or depending on how your game works that type of thing but if players are playing limited they're going to be forced to interact with these cards even if it's to say no i don't want this in my deck over and over again well then you can yeah. take a look at that card that's been consistently passed over um whereas in constructed you probably wouldn't think twice about a lot of cards that get passed over because that's normal. So Yeah, because that that card's just a common, and we have a rare that's just better. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's okay, but maybe you want that card to still be relevant in limited play or something like that. Yeah. yeah. You have anything to add to that, uh, cards? Um, I do think that um, like having too many formats is probably... Like, not ideal for somebody that's, like, at least just starting out anyways. But, um, like, like you said, how Magic has all that, all those different formats. Um, me, personally, I don't see myself going to do that many different formats. Um, just because it will, it definitely will separate uh, your fan base and, like, how many people would want to play those different formats. Um, so I think for it being successful, it should uh, still, like, always be... What's the word? Uh, accessible. Uh, just always being able to play it without having to go through all this yeah. trouble trying to find certain people to play with. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask a question this time. Okay. Since we're on this kind of topic of formats. Rotations. Ooh, yes. Do our rotations an aspect of a successful card game? Could you break down what rotations... So, uh, so Magic and Pokemon have rotations. They rotate old sets out as they release new sets. Meaning that... Um, Basically, meaning cards stop being used in the standard of the for of the game, where Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't rotate. the mm -hmm. The way to play you play Yu-Gi-Oh through you can play any card that's ever been printed, and it is a legal Yu-Gi-Oh deck no matter where you play, as long as it's not banned. So that's so. Sorry, what were you gonna say? No, you're good. I was just say so. That's the basic idea of a rotation. Okay, yeah, my whole, one of my whole premises of uh, Demi is to, I guess, not have rotations. I want, 
like 10 years down the road when we have every single uh, mythology covered, no matter what, the original cards are still viable and playable. So, you know, excluding uh, eventually, I'm going to shoot for not having any banned cards, but don't, you know, don't we all? But uh, yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. But it, it but if you don't if you don't put if you don't push barriers, you will eventually just the game can get boring. Yeah. That's where band cards come from, is barriers were pushed and they were pushed a little too hard. Yeah. So I'm personally I don't like that. I don't like having to keep up with every single new expansion. I don't I don't wanna sit there and wonder, oh man, this new set or whatever dropped. I can no longer use what I just, you know, built over the course of however long. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If Magic does that, and if they come out with a new set every four months, doesn't that mean you have to rebuy a whole new that's, so that's every the thing, four yeah. months? Yeah. Magic's so... rotations, quote unquote, every two years. Okay. Um, it's so a bunch of sets are in standard, and then. When a core set comes out, it rotates the co last core set and everything behind that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, yeah. It does create a situation where playing standard in Magic, you're dropping a bunch of money on Magic yeah. every time a set comes out because you're either buying cards to put in your already existing deck or you have to buy a new deck because the core of your deck just rotated out. Yeah, see, I can see that being bad. Imagine if you're a new player... And you just spent, like, you're getting into it, and you just spent, like, 200 bucks on a bunch of decks, a bunch of packs and everything. And what you don't know is next week they reset or whatever, and all that money you just spent is practically useless if everyone plays, you know, according to that. So, like, that's a surefire way to get some people to stop playing. Or... Yeah, no, I I 100% agree with that. Like uh, right when I got into Magic, I uh, I I built a really expensive deck, and then literally two weeks I couldn't play it anymore. So I could only play with friends. I couldn't go to tournaments. Um, so with my game, I plan on uh, pretty much doing the exact same thing you said was the not having those things that rotate out and just having everything available all all the time. Um, with hopes not having to ban any cards, but um, like uh, Exodus does this, um, they keep everything everything in all at once, and I think having that, like you, as many you can add as many expansions as you want, and build decks around those, and then some people may forget that there's. There's cards that are good in set one, and some people, you know, they just might completely forget about those. And then you'll always have different decks all the time. Yeah. Lots of lots of customization aspects to it. And if your deck doesn't, like, obviously doesn't rotate out, and there's good cards in the next set, rather than spending a whole bunch of money buying a brand new deck, just buy the new packs, get the new cards, put them in, and, yeah. So... I will say that I have a lot to say about that topic, actually. And I, <laughs> oh, I, I, I know. I knew it's guys. a topic that is a lot. <laughs> um, because I'm actually pro-rotation in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I will say that so. for response. like, yeah, for HTCG creators, like this is a problem that most of us will probably never deal with, right? You've got to create, like, you got to finish your base set. Then you need to make, like, five expansion sets before you even start probably even thinking about rotating anything. Like in Magic, a new set comes out every three months. They rotate every two years. They're like they're eight sets legal and standard. Uh, between five and eight state sets are always legal. So if you're an HTCG, are you going to make that many sets? Maybe not. Maybe you do, and then you can you know you need to start thinking about that. I'll say part of the reason that you would rotate is that you just can't keep all those cards in print. Um, it's kind of very stressful on a warehouse. Right, if if you need to keep all these old sets in, like if they're legal, then people need to be able to buy them. And if they can't buy them, then they're these really expensive, hard to get cards that people need or what they want. So do you keep them in print? Now, if you're using the game crafter, then it's print on demand, right? You don't have to worry about that at all. So that's a, a 
a benefit but the game to crafter not... can take a lot of time to get things to people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm saying if you're using the game crafter, yeah. people are going to be used to you know waiting a few weeks to get your your packs when they order them or things like that. But if you're not using the game crafter, are you going to keep all your old sets in print? Maybe not. I mean, I guess Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't. But I think I'm not well, a Yu-Gi-Oh Yu-Gi-Oh player. Reprint old darts often. So, so okay. The reprints. Um, my understanding is that Yu-Gi-Oh rotates cards by banning them or overshadowing them in power level. Like, mm-hmm. I know it's legal to play old cards, but do you really yeah, play old if cards? You play the original gen, like first generation Yu-Gi-Oh versus now. It, from what I heard, it's like a five five second game. Like they're just like so you lose. You know, there's a couple old cards that still see a lot of prof- or competitive play um, that do have, like, that do kind of have this play space of they constantly have to get reprinted, like uh, Mystical Space Typhoon is one of them. Because even though that's uh, in the uncommon slot in a Yu-Gi-Oh pack, it's like a $10 card. Because it's basically a three of an every deck. Um, and it's not a broken card, it's just a solid card. Yeah. And how many cards it, is that true for? Um, it, just, I, it just seems like yeah. most of the cards are technically not rotated out, but functionally they are. And there are going to be a few that they need to reprint and things like that. But Well, and I do think that's kind of one of the... That it does come down to the issue of what we talked about earlier of, um, and just in a constructed format, you end up with cards get overlooked. And if your game goes, and if your game doesn't rotate and just goes uh, for, let's say, Zyphon gets all of his uh, all of his mythologies in 10 years, that's still probably a number of sets that a lot of cards will get overlooked because there are just better cards, quote-unquote. Hmm. And I'm also pro-rotation because I think a rotation does a lot of work to keep the game from getting stale and reset power level for gameplay um, enjoyment. Hmm. I do understand that there are problems with it because there's not a perfect system for these kind of things. But I think lo- dropping cards to keep uh, to make other cards become good or and r- keeping the gameplay relatively fresh so people don't have to look at this combo that was uh, discovered and it just dominates the format until it gets banned. Yeah. And it's a really big risk if you're the creator and you've made 20 sets, say, and your game doesn't rotate. Well, what cards do you put in that 21st set that really make people want to come out and buy it. Mm-hmm. Are you making so, your cards stronger than before? <laughs> because now you're just having power creep. Well, as one of the biggest things that I hear for most TG- TCGs and why there's really just the the main three is the fact that no one really wants to buy card packs anymore and everything else, which is what, from what I've gathered, is the main uh, issue here. What if you sell either full packs of like you know all of the set you can spend like x amount of money or if you sell them individually and you as a um you know seller you just simply you know print on demand and if someone buys anything uh at least on npc as much as i hate to you know promote them uh you can print up to like 16 cards for like five bucks so, I mean, if you sell a card for $2 individually or something, if, you know, people want to buy them separately and not in a pack, you can you can technically do that as well. And wouldn't that solve a lot of the the issues with having just a bunch of stuff stuck in a warehouse and everything else? So, if we're talking about a HTCG that is probably broken into the level of TCG... um. I think that creates a new issue of now, why do game stores support your game? Because if they can't open a booster box um, and pull out singles that now have a monetary value to sell to the players, because you're just going to print them and and sell to the players that way, they have no reason to carry your game. 
they have no reason they barely have a reason to run tournaments unless you provide them with another reason to do that and that's where i want to break out to i eventually want to break into that zone and i just don't see enough of an upside of printing cards and then selling the cards myself to people instead of just selling booster boxes to lgs's and printing promos as like singles that i sell to LGSs or whatnot. So, um, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, uh, you can always make the boxes and everything have like ex- exclusive cards, ones you don't reprint. But like the some of the main cards that people might use a lot. I mean, you can you can probably sell them, you know, individually and have others that aren't. I guess potentially. Well, the main cards that people use a lot are going to be the ones where the value comes into play the only yeah. the only possible way around it is to like have like the maybe the foils or the special versions of the cards only appear in randomized booster packs but then you let people buy like a basic version of you of it print on demand from you or something like that yeah but yeah, yeah. i mean that's that's tough trying to figure that that balance um the another thing i i see is people are going to do it anyway you have thousands of Magic resellers and Yu-Gi-Oh resellers that are selling individual cards, and if you know they're gonna do it, regardless if Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh shuts them down, you know ten more are gonna open up. It's it's just a thing that you have to deal with with making almost anything is is resellers. So if you do it yourself, one you can cut back on them significantly, and two if it's already gonna happen, might as well have you do it so you one know that it's official and people won't get scammed which could potentially stain your name and mm-hmm. two uh you, you know you profit off of it as well versus you know someone else profiting off of your game which is in most cases illegal are we talking about a secondary market forming or are we talking about like chinese counterfeits um both, I guess, because you well, you have both. I mean, most people yeah. will go on and they resell actual copies. That's what I was yeah. referring to. Okay, that's arguably a healthy place for a game to be. Mm-hmm. That's what like I'm having a secondary, having a secondary market form where stores yeah. are yeah. selling singles of your cards to people. It means that there's demand for your cards. It means that people want them and are willing to spend twenty dollars on a card. Um, to play your game. I think that's a relatively healthy place to be because it means pe- maybe individuals aren't buying boost- as many booster packs, but stores are buying like cases of boxes. And they're yeah. buying and they're buying your product, which is you're still your product's still selling. Um if you don't if you don't want a secondary market for your game, then TCG is probably not the right type of game to make because that's yeah, like like you were saying, the a, a, sec, a strong, healthy secondary market is like a very clear signifier of a healthy trading card game. Yeah, and I guess it, it gives people the motivation to buy packs for the resale mm-hmm. value. So right. I guess in doing people that, at every you, tier. Yeah. Okay. So I, I definitely I, I can see all of y'all's points now because you sell individually, you are no longer allowing other people. Resell, which means if you find a super rare card in a pack and you can buy it for ten bucks on the website versus selling it for twenty yourself, there's no point. So, right. yeah. okay. Although, take a look at what Magic's been doing, which is the secret layers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these. Yes. Basically, Wizards of the Coast is putting together box sets of fancy versions of relatively popular cards. They're selling them direct to consumers. They're skipping distributors, distributors, and retailers. Um, and they're they're basically selling singles of so, cards that people are willing to pay money for. So this is kind of new, but they've been going at it pretty strong and fast. And we'll still oh, time yeah. will tell how that all plays out. But I know there are a lot Jokes of people. Jokes are we'll have eleven thousand by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're selling a lot, but they're also making people mad. Distributors and retailers are like, well, why is Magic selling these cards that they're basically cutting us out of the loop? And so. The question- what I view as one of the only redeeming qualities about these is they're only around for a day. 
sure. you can only get them that day. So it means there's there is a minimal there is a maximum basically that could be produced. That's true. It's not like you can go onto the wizard store website and be like, I want to buy four timer boys. It's like no, you got to be there when the secret layer drops. Um, yeah, and that but is it's so... just it's Sorry. it's pretty close to what Zy- Zyphine's talking about, right? As the yeah, the first so... time really we put game publishers selling essentially singles of their own tra- trading card game. Now, what if you sell singles of all your products, but they are super common and you have... So, if you buy from the publisher, it's like pretty much a second edition version of all your game, or all the cards, and they're not valuable at all, and you pretty much make it so... There's there's no resale value in those cards. However, all the cards in the packs are custom artwork, and those are the chances to get exclusive cards and stuff like that, such as holographics or foil cards and and stuff like it, that. What is y'all's opinion? It runs a thin line because again, cards tend to run value based on how played they are. And if you just have a card that you can basically just buy for like two bucks from the uh, the creator, that is the most played card in your game. Let's say let's say every deck in the game plays as many copies as are allowed. You end up running such a thin line there because even if there's a special fancier version of it, most players are going to play with the two dollar version because. Mm-hmm. They're just a lot of players are just looking to play the game. They aren't uh, for terms people use whales who foil out the whole deck, use only the full art versions, do as much as they can to make it as expensive as possible. Um, and there's like it, it makes your game accessible. That is the big thing that that does. It's a it's accessible. There's no seventy dollar card in the core set that is base is at like the highest rarity that uh, like almost every deck people play plays maximum copies. Yeah, because that that can be a problem. Um, that can lead to a lot of problems. It uh, when Yu Gi Oh release Pendulum, uh, the I can't remember his name, but there was a Pendulum Magician who was $100 a copy, and any deck that wanted to play with Pendulums played three. There was no not playing him. And he was only available in Ultra Rare Plus, I'm pretty sure. So you you only maybe opened one a box, zero to one a box. And that created him to be stupid expensive and created a lot of issues. I remember at that time because people were like, I don't want my base, the start of my deck to be $300, and that's only three cards. Yeah. So, it's running a line. I think um, I think when you talk about those kind of things, Yu-Gi-Oh! prints, I think Yu-Gi-Oh! gets this right. They print gold sets or things similar to where they reprint really expensive cards that you're basically in a and you buy a pack and you get like 15 out of like 40 cards. And it help and they normally reprint those cards that are just super fucking expensive. And then you and that just kind of cuts the value on those, giving people the cards they need to play, but not uh, but still keeping booster boxes worth buying for people who want to play the game and stores so my only i guess fear and the reason why i brought all this up is the fact that more people have told me that the whole tcg um i guess just marketing strategy or the way that you sell and resell is an outdated version and that most people are no longer really interested in doing that so, I just, I think that there should be a way where we can go about doing a basic TCG while 
rebranding it for modern day, I guess. And what what were you gonna say, Fission? A lot. Yeah, I have a lot to say about that topic. Um, the people who say that are talking about themselves. They're not talking about everybody. Clearly, the growth of Magic and the continued success of like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and Cardfight Vanguard and various games in Japan demonstrate that the TC, TCG market is fine, and it's just these people are burnt out on it. They don't want a part of it, and then they go around telling everybody that nobody wants it anymore which is just not true. There are always new people getting NCGs and people who love them. And if you want, love them too, do it. I, I, I agree with them in some respects, which is that it's extremely hard to break into the TCG market. Right? The biggest three games have been the biggest three games for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've seen new games come out, and we've seen new games go away. Things like Lightseekers, Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, Champions. Um, the relatively new game that's kind of doing real well, but it's only its second set is coming out soon. Right, uh, that's uh, Flesh and Blood. They're coming out with Arcane oh. Rising. Yeah, Flesh um, and Blood actually looks like a real neat game. I want to get it. I want to look into it a little bit. There's a relatively new game called Argent Saga. Um, yeah. So these are games that we'll watch. But like Lightseekers and Warhammer uh, Champions, as far as I can tell, they're gone already. So th there's some truth to the idea that you know breaking in with a new big TCG is um, unlikely and very difficult. But there are a lot of TCG players still. So to just say that the TCG market is dead is insane because it's just false. Um, but there are other ways to make a similar style of game, right? You want players to be able to build their decks and battle each other? Great. I mean, there's the LCG model from Fantasy Flight. They've got the copyright on that term, living card game. But there are you can copy that same business model. We come out with fixed packs. Generally, each expansion contains all the copies a full play set of every card included. Um, you could do that. There are games that do that. Um, Keyforge is neat. Keyforge is super unique, right? Um, mm -hmm. Every yeah. deck is completely a unique list of cards uh, that no other deck has that exact same deck list. Um, that's super cool. I mean, it's hard to pull out that kind of thing, but... Um, yeah, but so it's, wanted... it's a neat take on the process. Yeah, I agree. I like Keyforge a lot. Um, so, you mean, Zyphine, you're talking about making a fixed set of cards and releasing that and then having booster packs that have like fancy versions that actually reminds me of the magic collectors edition booster boxes they've been coming out with for the past couple sets which is they've got their standard draft booster boxes that have all the sets all the cards that you've known for years from magic but then they make a parallel booster pack product that can't really be drafted but has like special versions and foil versions of all those same cards and they cost more uh, and people buy them so what if you did an LCG, or again, you can't use the term LCG, yeah. but you make an LCG, and then you make collector booster boxes, right? And that contains randomized product with special versions of cards. I like that idea. We haven't seen that specifically. Um, honestly, I think you sell fewer collector's edition boxes than you would just of your core set. you got to be prepared to sell... Um, you got to be prepared for the idea that your game is primarily not going to be a TCG. It's going to be this expandable card game or living card game model, but maybe you use these collector boosters as a price support, right? Or, or the big spender, the whales, right? The whales can buy yeah. these boxes yeah. pulling out their, their decks. I would like to see a game try that. Um, I haven't seen it before. Cards, do you have anything? You've been quiet for a little bit now. Yeah, man, I'm just listening. That was, uh, those were all really good, uh, <laughs> all really good things. Um, Honestly, I kind of agree with like all of your um, different perspectives on it because uh, that's like a, that's like a really kind of touchy subject. Um, I just uh, I guess I believe in a lot of cards just like having value but still being accessible to everybody. But uh, yeah, but I think that's all I have to say. I don't really. Uh... It's like a it's like a dream, right? You yeah. want anyone to be able to jump in and play, but you also want booster packs to have value, right? You want people to be yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of your booster packs, and no one's going to be excited to open a booster pack if nothing in your game is worth anything. If everything's easily accessible, then nothing's exciting. So, yeah, yeah, that's not true. The people who are first getting into the game will be excited to open the booster pack, no matter what. But, but you'll be excited once they're in the game. Once they're in, excited. and they yeah. You'll be excited to open a pack if you're drafting, right? Then you care what the rare is in that pack. Um, 
yeah, no, it's it's a tough one. It, again, it's a line that it's a very thin line that if you could straddle, it would be a dream, like like you said. Mm-hmm. But I have a I have a couple. I have a crossover topic between we were talking about rotation, and now we're talking about kind of like a an LCG or expandable card game. Mm-hmm. I because if you look at some people will say that the competitive LCGs from Fantasy Flight Games have failed over the years. Um, things like they have a Game of Thrones LCG that they're not really supporting. Um, Android Netrunner died, although that was licensed to use rather than the game can't itself. Really um, use Game of Thrones though as an example because the last season killed the whole thing for the whole community. So, yeah. well, I mean, if you ask one of these LCG players, one of the problems was after a few years they didn't they didn't rotate. So after a few years some of these old packs they weren't keeping in print and they couldn't you couldn't find them and if you needed a particular card it's basically impossible if you wanted to get into the game and you wanted to buy everything because a lot of tcg players don't feel like they need to have everything a lot of living card game players do feel like they need to have everything um and when an older set was out of print or an older pack you couldn't get it now you can't have those cards for your deck things like that that was the type of thing that made the game die but i'd like to see a competitive lcg that rotates because then you don't have to worry about these old packs being accessible you just uh let players know that they only need to get the past year's worth of cards like if you're a new player you can join this game maybe just pick up a few packs the most you'll need one year's worth of packs of cards um and that lowers the barrier of entry for a new player to get like that so yeah. that's a counterpoint of rotation is like oh i've just bought my deck and now i can't even play it anymore it's like okay well how about we have the all cards are legal problem where you just joined a game and now you need to catch up on thousands of dollars of pass yeah. uh, stuff. But so yeah, crossover a, a rotating living card game. Somebody make that, and then make collector boosters with prize promos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be neat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I think we. About that now. <laughs> yeah. I think we, I think we went off topic from what makes a yeah successful homemade TCG. <laughs> so, a little I bit. Had I had a note for the what makes a successful HTC. You brought up something briefly. Um, fan art for your game. Do you think Ooh. when your community starts getting so interested that they start making artwork and other miscellaneous stuff for your game? Do you view that as a success? Because I personally... Yeah, people do that for me. Okay. Yeah, that's my so now, goal. I have a plan for this, for Broken Blades. When people start making fan art of some of these characters and stuff, I want to find some of those and hire them to make art, art for the game. Mm. That is what I want to do if, when I get to that point. Because I, I want to not only... Re- I don't want to look at that and go, that's neat. I want to reward that. Yeah, yeah. I feel the same way. I was thinking about doing something similar, but taking the fan art, and if it's good enough, pretty much adding a new edition of the card with that artwork as like yeah, like a promo exclusive, and then give them some sort of per- percentage, possibly. I don't know the legality behind that or or whatnot, but um, you just have to buy the rights to the art, technically, yeah. or at least buy usage rights. Yeah. yeah. Because all my artists, I let them know that I just really want the right to print it, but I don't want to take away any of their rights to it. So I'm just looking for the right to print it on cards, but if they wanted to make prints of it and whatnot, feel free. Uh, yeah, see, yeah, I did the same, yeah. Oh, see, I own the full rights to any card or any well, image my artist so, does. Well, okay, so I own all the I own the full rights to all my icons and all that. Um. It's purely the artwork I choose to only own partial rights on. Um, because I want them to feel free to make prints. And if Broken Blades ever has even a semi-large tournament, and I invite some of the artists to come around, I want them to have be able to print play mats and prints and sell them at the tournament. Yeah. Um, and then they have stuff to sell besides just signing cards. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at magics like Grand Prix or Magic Fest, sorry, um, 
they invite artists all the time, but and they also do something at least semi similar because there's always prints and play mats at the artists' booths there. And I just think that's a really great way for your community to meet the artists, but also um, to support their favorite artists. Fair enough. That's true. But yeah, fan art, fan fiction too, and even players mm -hmm. making custom cards are all um, oh very exciting. Mm -hmm. I no, actually that's have. Huge... Sorry. I'd, I'd love to be able to. Um, I have plans to whatever game I finish next. I don't know what it'll be, but the idea of making like an open game license, um, and not only like have people making fan cards, but just say, hey, not only can you draw fan fiction and make fan cards, but if you want to make a fan card and do the art for it, you can make your own packs and sell them. Hmm. Um, I know that's definitely not something I'd recommend for just like anybody to try to do if you're trying to run a business or start a company, but if you're just making a game for fun. Huh. Uh, and you don't expect a lot from it. There's not a lot to lose, I think, um, from just saying, hey, make your own packs. Make your own cards. Sell them. Uh, Fish, you have the neatest ideas. An open <laughs> license PCG and yeah. a rotating living, t uh, living card game. <laughs> Those are really neat the ideas. The balancing, though, would be a nightmare. Oh. Oh. Yeah, the know. open license <laughs> balancing would be insane. Yeah, but... <laughs> No thing. More like curating a ban list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, um, but it's still such a neat concept because that would be so community involved. Yeah. Even if it's something that you review, I think having a review system would make it. Be, that way, you you know a card's not completely broken. If, sure. if you, you don't print do it, one piece Exodia. Yeah. <laughs> if this is in your open hand, you win. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I've I've given it some thought. The risk of doing a review process is now you are putting work on yourself to like balance other people's projects. Um, so it's a it's a, it is an awkward situation to be in. But arguably, though, there's no cost for them to make cards, so it doesn't have to be balancing. There could also just be a flat out reject, since yeah. there's no technical cost for them to make cards, um, and basically say it's an accept reject or review or uh or balance and if something's just so flat out broken you can just hit the reject button and send it back to them and say you can work on this but until it's better i'm not gonna do yeah. minor tweaking i got two things yeah okay uh this is going back to like fan art and stuff yeah we got um, off topic again <laughs> that's okay so uh, it's good to listen to i'm enjoying it um uh, I actually, like, it's just, it's just a cool thing about my game. It's not really uh, on topic, per se. But um, you guys are familiar with uh, Monster Energy Drink, right? Yeah. yeah. Obviously. Um, the official DJ, uh, Matt the Alien, uh, he actually follows Ish, my game, and he's in my game. Oh, neat. So he's nice. actually, yeah, he's got his own card and everything. We got his permission and everything. And so uh, your game for... is actually Monster Energy Drink fan art. Uh, I, I guess, <laughs> in a way. What I'm um, hearing is you have a step in the door to if you go to release the game like full public, look at it and go, Monster Energy sponsor this. Yeah, pretty much. Well, it's not necessarily Monster Energy Drink that sponsored it. It's He's like the sponsored official DJ of Monster Energy. Yes, so like but you have the foot in the door yeah. for him to I do, go yeah. do this. So, yeah, <laughs> probably... like there's still... You go ahead. No, no, no. You're good. I also forget what I was going to say. <laughs> but the foot in the door thing is, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to do with a bunch of everything, like a bunch of my stuff. I also do like a, a lot of, um, like uh, from my favorite five TCGs that I had, uh, HTCGs uh, going in, I have like, uh, they're all in my game, like uh, Dom Han Rhapsody, uh, Black and Chrono is in my game. Um, I have uh, Chris from Wrath, of course, Scott from Lewis and Soul Legends, uh, Jared from Skyscape, and Martin from... Uh, Resolution Breakers. I have them all in my game too. No and, sense. Uh, man. Come on, man. I'm 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 working on it, man. I'm working on it. I'm getting everybody in here. As anybody wants to be in it, I'm just I'm all for it. But uh, I do have uh, uh, one one card in my game that I allow anybody to do anything with. It's uh, my Timeless Knight. 
Like I have, uh, uh, he changed the name of his TCG, so I'm not sure. But uh, he uh, made an 8-bit version of it and put it in his game. And uh, I sort of have that as my uh, my thing that was like, everybody knows where that came from. So that's like my free, well, I don't know the exact word, but uh, that's my... Uh, yeah, just if you it's your if you want to use it, put it in your game thing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Your crossover card. Yeah, yeah. my crossover card. That, that is my crossover card. So, <laughs> cool. One... I like that. I would like to see actually. I'd love to see if a lot of more homemade TCG creators like had kind of free crossover card license type of thing for people to insert their own characters into each other's games or vice versa. Mm. I made the HTCG uh, card yeah. game. I made Sin um, for Broken Blades, and I, I saw that Siphon. Um, Siphon's just a cleric, and his title is just a uh, Speaker of the Gods. But um, I didn't know what to do with his ability yet, so you're just a work in progress. Cool sitting in the file. I play cleric or tank in every every like RPG game possible. <laughs> cool. Glad it, glad it fit. <laughs> you guys familiar with Eldritch Kingdom? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Seen yeah, yeah. Some of it. I haven't actually talked to him. Yeah. Well, he oh, hasn't yeah, been around to... a while, but I think he's. I think he's kind of back from a hiatus. Um, but for a while, he was doing a pretty good YouTube channel, and his art is great. And oh, it's super cool. like dark, gothic, uh, creepy Cthulhu stuff. Um, his crossovers are so cool. <laughs> and and yeah, he does these these videos where he he'll take characters from other games and he illustrates them. Um, in his style, so it's just like a totally different creation. But when you look at them side by side, you're like, oh yeah, I guess that is, I guess that is kind of the same. Yeah. Um, actually, I think I have some Elders Kingdom here for anybody unfamiliar. Maybe I can pull out one sample card of how. I, I wish my videos work. I got a bunch of his cards. <laughs> wow. yeah, it is. yeah, but super well done type of stuff. The murder of crows. Oh yeah, but yeah, that's pretty. We need to get them in to HD. Oh yeah, games. I didn't so, know he was back though. Uh, jumping back to the successful HTCG, and also yes. to caveat on the monster thing, getting either a large company, a individual, or something else like that to be either like a part of your card game or even doing crossovers d does that is that successful for y'all because right now i don't know if you ever heard of it but lore olympus it's a webtoon my girlfriends both read it so they told me about her and it's it's a really big greek oh webtoon. yes i know this one yeah well i'm i've been trying and i've been i've been sending her it like once a month just being like hey in case you read this do you want to do a potential crossover in the future? But, like, if I ever got that, I think that would be a huge success because, one, yeah. a lot of people love the webtoon and her artwork, and, two, it'd be a brand-new exclusive card or cards that I would be able to pretty much promote. Yeah. No, that would be super cool. I don't actually know um, what I would, like, if I could have any one per, uh inter, anything sponsor uh, my game i don't actually know what i would want that would be a tough think you should do something like a i was going to say some really corny joke but i it it lost me like a switchblade company or something you know you know, right i should just no i i, I know now <laughs> the man at arms youtube channel mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say in some sense, like a fan art, you get that fan, fan art vibe from that, where it's like you get something a little bit different into your game from people who like it. Um, but it sounds what you're kind of talking about is it's almost like a marketing strategy. It's just like a cross-promotion marketing strategy. Yeah. Um, and so getting someone who's got their own fan base to kind of sign off on yours, and you kind of get to share fan bases with those people. Um, yeah. Pretty cool. 
Yeah, that's. I think having that would would count as a uh, as a success because if you have someone else with a slightly larger fan base willing to pretty much promote your thing, it it shows that you know other successful people are you know showing interest. Like on Instagram, yeah. I've been promoting my Instagram. It's the the main thing I promote. I just I almost at twelve fifty uh, followers, but I had someone hit me up who also had like a thousand followers being like, Hey, you know, I do a, uh, I own a website and a podcast where we talk about a bunch of different games and stuff like that. I was wondering if I could play your game, but sadly, is this where the podcast idea came from? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I think it randomly popped up. I think someone else brought it up in the chat and I was like, oh, okay. that's a cool, that's a good idea. But, uh, <laughs> Sadly, my game wasn't compatible with his because he it was a comedy channel. And after looking over it, I was like, hey, my game's not comedy. So he was like, all right, well, if we ever branch out, I'd love to play your game. So <laughs> just stuff like that. I, I personally find both motivating and also it it shows me that I'm starting to become, I guess, larger in a sense. And I guess popularity wise for me is a successful thing that I'm looking for. Mm. What about y'all? I feel that. I mean, like, uh, one of my biggest things is, uh, like, my game's not very big right now. Not a lot of people, well, it's not purchased a lot. Like, a few people have bought my game. But, uh, I like, I have a lot of, like, friends and, like, people in real life that come over. Like, they play my game. Um... I think, um, like, one thing I like about uh, the whole HTC G a HTCG community is that basically everybody knows who I am. So that's, like, my that's my start. Yeah. Um, because at the beginning of this, my big thing on success was community. No, I definitely uh, – popularity and getting to that point where there's a load of people who just uh, enjoy – every bit of my game is would be huge for me. Mm -hmm. I would love that, and it's what I'm working towards. Yeah. And popularity is, like, fun, but it's also actually kind of important for TCGs because uh, to some degree you need a, a critical mass of players, like a certain threshold of people who know about and play your game so that people have players to play with. Yeah. Um, TCGs generally aren't the type of game where one person brings all the decks like they yeah. would with a board game or sometimes even a living card game. You kind of expect someone else is going to have their own deck, which means they need to have their own collection. Yeah. Uh, so popularity is, you know, what high schoolers care about, but it's also um, actually valuable TCG. Mm. So what about being uh, popular on a third-party system? For example, I was on the first page of Tabletop Simulator for a good two weeks. Like, do y'all think that has any effect? Because I personally, I didn't gain any actual member base to, like, my Discord. I got a few views, actually a lot of views, on my website, but nothing past just views on the website. Well, yeah, I would say no. views are always a start. Um, and it got you more views which is means more people looking at it so that's the start to it i think i, I personally think it's like really cool it's it's fun it's, it's cool to see but honestly i would say it's actually maybe dangerous um popularity is great like i was just saying but on the other hand popularity for popularity's sake yeah. is almost useless if everyone just sees your game and then you didn't get an increase in you know your mailing list or your sales or your yeah this conversation or your youtube channel like if that doesn't transition into something permanent or more long term then it was just fleeting and now it's gone and all those people who saw your are gone now and if they see your game again they probably they'll think oh, i saw that before and if you've improved your game by then or something like that that's a, those are changes that those people will never uh, acknowledge most Very likely true. Um, yeah. So the more you get an unfinished product in front of a bunch of people, it could actually be worse for you in the long run. Yeah, like my personal fear is, uh, and like a lot of people are like, oh, I want to get really big really quickly. 
my personal fear is getting like just say like I gained a hundred thousand subscribers tomorrow. I got to keep up with all that. Like these hundred thousand new people are expecting like brand new stuff, and I'm basically just doing this game by myself. Yeah. And yeah, I would I would hate to have to like well I'm I wouldn't say work harder, but just to keep up with all that. So I think a slower thing, well in my case anyways, would be better. No, I I understand. Even having a small team, like I have me, one artist, and one developer. And mm. that's it. If I blew up as well, there's only so much artwork that the one artist could do, you know, back to back. He yeah. he tends to put out a card maybe once every week and a half. Uh, so having that would be, yeah, super, super stressful. Because then if you have 100,000 people, people are going to expect more frequent uh, updates and everything else. And you'd have to hire more people. Even if you do it by yourself, you'd have to hire other people. And that's where some things can get lost, such as artwork. I have one artist because I want my artwork to be the exact same. But yeah. If I hire an artist, they can recreate it, but there's a, still a chance that it's not the same feel to it, if that makes sense. Well, you know, that makes perfect sense. So, but like, uh, another way I guess you could look at it is take Pokemon, for example. You see all like the weird versions they have. Like, yeah. they have like ones that are like knitted or ones made out of clay. And like, it's, there's so many different varieties of, of drawing and, and it still works well. Well, and to be fair, magic does somewhat that's, of a similar that's, thing. That's you, have, you do have a but magic has so many artists who have made cards before, and you end up with you can it does take away sometimes when you have a card that is done like extremely differently than another card, and they are played next to each other, and sometimes yeah. it just doesn't look right. But on the same side, um. You, it still works, and providing all those different types of art help people kind of f find their favorites. Because mm -hmm. some people might not like the style that card uh, card A was done in, but would but really likes the style card B was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, but I, I also don't think like that. A, I don't think there's a wrong option here because mm -hmm. I love Sinfinite style. And all no. of his cards, he does. Yeah. So I'm collecting every single one. I don't even care. Yeah, they're all him. So yeah. it's all one style, and that works. Um, but I also do think that, yeah, you can totally get different artists and have different styles in a game, and it still work. Yeah. Like, I have... Um... I, what I do is I like I go around on Facebook and look for people who are like they're artists, but they're like they don't have any pub, like well, I would say publicity or. Follow. And I yeah. ask like, hey, do you want to do a card for my game? I'm not gonna like pay you, but you know, do you want to do this as like a for free? And like I have uh, so many people that have offered just to be like, hey, here's a here's some art, here's some art, throw it in your game. Only thing is with that is you can in the art community, uh, you can actually stain yourself uh by yes. doing that because a lot of the art community despises people that uh that do stuff like that the whole like yeah, oh, I do it for free just for publicity type thing mm -hmm. so, i didn't actually like say that well yeah and, yeah but yeah but like um, yeah well, yeah but i know what you mean yeah and that's an important thing to say for if someone listens to this podcast and yeah. uh goes to do something at least let like it's it should be said. Um, I do something semi similar. I do fi try to find local artists. Um, in my experience, local artists are cheaper than yeah, professional that's true. artists I found online. Like just in general, the, even if you ask for a price, they'll offer you a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, and that can also just help. That's true. Like I uh, I looked on Facebook in a like a Fable fan like. Like, they just did a... Everybody's familiar with uh, Fable, the big video yeah. game, right? Yeah. Um, I, I just found this one guy randomly. I loved his art. And I was like, hey, did you want to, you know, possibly do a few cards for me? He did those for for free. And 
he's I still have him on now. I'm paying him now for them. But like I that, that guy's like one of my best friends now. Like it was over two years ago and I just randomly found him on Facebook. I I tend to find my artist on uh what is it called? Deviant art. That's that's normal oh, yeah. go for all mine and the good thing is you have so many people that make a living just off of deviant art and doing commissions that you make a post and you get just sometimes literal thousands of messages. Most of the time it's it's a hundred to two hundred. But um you'll always find people and with that you can find the the right artwork and for the right price, depending on yeah. and a lot of them um originally my artist was going to do it for i think 75 dollars in artwork but i told him that i'm planning on pretty much buying in bulk all the time and he's going to be the main artist for the artwork so he ended up cutting me down to 60 dollars uh per per piece oh well, that's that's, yeah, pro that's um, roughly what i pay for a picture too i find my non-local artists on fiverr and art station I, I did a couple on Fiverr, but uh, didn't actually turn out the way I wanted. But I, I do like going to Fiverr every now and again for some stuff. I tend so to Fiverr, art. Fiverr has the uh, added bonus if you have a third party that kind of will help police things if things go wrong. Yeah. You can get your money, quote-unquote, back. It's in f credit on Fiverr, but yeah. it, you... You can get your money back and if something goes bad. So I tend to find people on Fiverr or if I'm on ArtStation, I look for signs that these people do do commissions because I don't want to pay someone for them to then peace out. Yeah. But Fiverr can be sketchy still. I, I paid someone um, to do 12... Uh, favorite cons emojis and halfway through he was like all right i'm done and he tried like saying that it was finished because he did one and i was like i paid for 12 and he was like oh no i oh, just sent this to you 12 times yeah i yeah, I yeah that, things it, about that. It sucks. It, there's still yeah i'm not saying there can't be issues because that does suck yeah but it's one of those things of having the third party backing you yeah, a little bit. Because I did get my money back. To, yeah. Having the third party there to go, no, this isn't how things are done. Instead of being in emails and um, going, can you do this thing? They go, yeah, sure, I'll do it for uh, price. And then they're like, I want half up front and half on completion. You pay them half. And they they never respond to you again. Yeah, quick um, plug. That's that's what I'm doing for HDCG News is a uh, resource manager or the marketplace specifically mm -hmm. to help out, you know, with this, so people can find commission artists and stuff. Like I've that. only had that happen to me once, and luckily it was only for forty bucks. Mm. So because they wanted uh, forty dollars. No, it's I'm not happy about losing yeah, it, yeah. but I'm <laughs> I'm more happy that it was. $40 on a like hundred dollar piece that was supposed to be the final price compared to if it was Ben Jackson or Mantha's Lapis that did it to me where they're charging me closer to $300 total. Yeah. That'd, that'd be a hit. You have anything yeah. to, to say, Fission? On the topic of art? Well, I, I, it's kind of a deviation to the topic, but I would say that um, actually I think a lot of homemade TCG creators are art first and game designer second um and i think all four of us that's not true right no. <laughs> i think all four of us are, are game designers first um and but so it's something we didn't really touch on talking about professional or successful htcgs is the idea of you know what does it look like um what's your art style what's um so i think again i would just to tie that back to our original topic I think if, if it's your art and you're expressing yourself, um, then that's a success. Uh, well, and, and that could be one of your goals. It could be a medium to express your art. And right. if that's what you're using it for and you're creating cards with your own art, that's a success in the, of its own. 
Yeah. Right. Especially if it leads to people enjoying the art and potentially getting you commissions and stuff. I mean, look at Sinfinite. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are like, man, we'll pay you to make your rule book. Like, he, yeah, he went. From, I offered it too. Yeah, me, me too. Like, he went from just making. What was his, his answer? Stuff. I thought of it. He, he said he's too busy, but he said in the yeah. future he's planning on potentially doing it, which is okay. still really cool, I think. But yeah, uh, it. I agree. That is that is definitely an, a success, especially if other people are willing to acknowledge um, i guess your artistic skills and everything mm -hmm. right i, I will admit like... i think just completely off topic for a second i find it i think the thing i find the most amusing about sinfinite is he does a lot of the sketches on his lunch at work yeah <laughs> yeah like he's at work on his 30 minute lunch sketching while eating and he they and he's like yeah that's a pretty solid robot <laughs> yeah I forget who it was, but I saw a YouTuber a while back, a uh, homemade TCG creator, who would share a lot of his artwork, and at some point, he was, he was struggling with the rules to his game. He didn't know how it was going to work, and at some point, he just said, never mind, um, my homemade TCG is not going to be a game. And I was like, well, it's kind of not a game. It's not an HTCG, I guess, but for him, it was really just about illustrating these parts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for some people, the passion is in the game, and some people, the passion is in art. And then, you know, you're talking about trying to find artists to work for free. I mean, it'd be great. The artists don't want... Artists shouldn't have to work for free. Yeah. Um, game designers shouldn't have to work for free. But we're doing what we're passionate about. I mean, it'd be great. It, I guess the best case scenario is, like, you have a best friend who's passionate about working with you, right? And then you get to just work together on a passion project and then nobody's spending 60 to $200 per yeah. card or something like that yeah. on artwork. And but, um, but yeah, HTCGs are interesting because people just come at with their different goals and different talents. So, mm -hmm. so, um, as a designer, I've done, I've done some of my own artwork. Yeah. It ranges from bad to mediocre. I've commissioned inexpensive artwork and I've expensed, commissioned expensive artwork and um i've bought so one thing people you guys haven't mentioned yet is the idea of buying an asset pack so there are usually they expect them to be used in video games but you can buy um asset packs you can buy il the rights to use particular illustrations even the game crafter has a game design resources section yeah, yeah. where you can um you can buy licenses to games uh, the game I've been working on most recently, I bought a pack of pixel art uh, very inexpensively, and it came with a lot of different pieces. Um, so buying asset packs, as long as you don't mind the idea that you might be sharing these pictures with other game designers, um, can be pretty cheap. So um, ooh, drive through I RPG went about a lot that a, well. I went about that a little differently. I found a asset pack artist and had mm. them make me my own. Uh, well, then you're so just I'm not sharing, but I much. bought. So, uh, I don't know if y'all know about this. It it's mostly for web developers and other stuff like that. However, they do have a lot of assets and lots of packs. It's um, Envato Elements. It is a sub website for a major website called Envato, which mostly focuses on animation or uh. Graphics, animations, websites, and stuff like that. However, for I think a hundred dollars a year, you have access to a vast majority of their assets. And when I say vast, I mean just alone, they have over a million. Uh, uh, I can't stock images. That's completely like a hundred percent professional. And on top of that you have the rights, like complete rights to the images. Even after the uh, the yearly purchase is up, if you don't renew, you still have the license itself. They send you a license like t uh, text file. So no matter what, I use that a lot for background music and my videos and my games and stuff, excluding Demi because I paid for one, but for like HTCG News, all the background music is 100% from uh, Elements. 
you they have lots of 3D models. They have game packs, icon packs, lots and lots of icon packs. Actually, the drink it thing I showed I showed you. Yeah. Not just the icons from it, but I'm gonna be honest. the The logo was on it too. I I edited a lot of it. Um, mm. but you can find logos, game packs. I mean, it's it's the whole nine yards. It's pretty cool. But that's what I use a lot for for a lot of things. If you just want basic icons, you can go to game icons.net, which just has a bunch of free icons you can. Use. Okay, uh, Icon Finder is another one, and they have they have a tab where you can click on it and look for specifically commercial free. So you're allowed to use it commercially. Yeah, Icon Finder. Which, which site was that? Icon, Icon Finder. Finder com. Yeah, dot com. Game Dash Icons on that has a lot of stuff that's kind of targeted for games because I filtered through some of these like stock art sites before, um, and it can be hard to find something relevant. Yeah. But game icons is just like game stuff, like fantasy, sci-fi yeah. icons. Of, they include like cards and dice and things like that. It can be harder to find. Afterwards. They're very basic, but they let you customize the colors and things like that. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. After this, if you don't mind sending me the link, that way I can add it to the description of everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you guys mind if I plug the artist who did my icons? No, yeah, feel free. Yeah, so I found him on Fiverr. It's uh, KYWK88. And he's done every icon in my uh, in Broken Blades. Okay. Cool. And people love, like, I have found out that people really love uh, the Drake and Vows icon, which is that three headed dragon. Um, and. He's done amazing work. Like, I will probably go back to him for any other icons I ever need. Okay. And speaking of plug, I guess now's probably the best time to do it for uh, the community spotlight. Um, yes. We have, for this episode, um, a person that just came back. Everyone other than myself... Uh, <laughs> knows and loves her, but it's a uh, black in chrono. Yes. Here, here's some artwork, or here's her YouTube channel. Um, I bad at pr pronouncing it, so if anyone wants to try pronouncing her YouTube channel for me, that'd be great. D Dumb Hand Rhapsody. Yep. We missed you, and we love you, and don't ever leave us again. This is some of her artwork as well for I think her latest game. Now, yes. don't make the same mistake as me. This is actual like pictures of her game. She just uses a very nice quality photo. Yeah, she's really good. <laughs> but um, that game is called the Potion Rush. Okay, Potion mm -hmm. Rust. Rush. The Rush, link yeah. for it looks so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, does. it really does. The link for all of that will be in the description of. I don't know if you can do descriptions for Twitch, but definitely for this YouTube version, uh, it'll be in the description below. And then she also goes by uh, Batchy Blackie Boards. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, I got some. Uh, got some of my booster packs. I still haven't opened. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't keep them sealed, man. I had to open them up right away. Their her cards are beautiful. They're they're fantastic. To anyone this... currently watching, I'm sending all the information that we just discussed below. My and favorites are the mochis. Yeah, the mochi. I like all of her dragons. Their dragons are pretty cool. The, any magical fluff here. And then also the YouTube. So. I've talked to her about doing art for my game before, and she actually might end up doing it. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, that's there's actually cool. one T, uh, one HTCG that has uh, exclusively just her art, and I forget uh, forget which one it is. But uh, no, she uh, she definitely does do that. It's really it's really cool. 
She seems very prolific. Yeah. She's she's done some con presents, I think, mostly in Mexico. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, she, she lives like in that. Mexico. I'm really excited for my convention. I know I keep bringing it up, but that's... Hey, it's a thing to be excited about. Yeah, I mean... I got a couple of showcases coming eventually. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exciting. And also very anxiety-inducing, seeing as I'm pretty socially <laughs> awkward, so... Oh, me too, man. Yeah. Me too. I'm Yeah, I'm literally sweating right now just because of this, this stream. <laughs> I, I've always been a salesperson. I could sell ice to an Eskimo. See, when I get into the mood, I can. But, like, to, to get into that mindset takes me a lot. So, yeah. my very first time I went to the a local game shop, I actually downed a glass of beer beforehand to help me loosen <laughs> up. So, yeah. I just take my medication before I go anywhere. Uh. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, any anything else you think we uh, should cover that we haven't? There is one thing that I kind of it's and it's this is like probably should have said this at the start of the stream. Yeah, you but, know this is a pretty free, free form podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially right now until we get in the groove of everything. Yeah. Um, what makes a successful TCG uh, originality? There's a lot of I like I've I've. I'm a YouTube fiend, and since I have a lot of free time, I look at every single TCG I can find on YouTube. And there, okay, I'm not, and I don't mean to like say anything. I'm not trying to say anything badly about anybody. Um, there's a lot of copies of Chaos Galaxy, and uh, oh yeah, I, I think one major thing is you have to have at least a little bit of originality to be successful. Yeah. Well, Nobody I also wants a copy. think. I also think that's the secret to breaking into the TCG market. If your game is original and ha still is fun, but is something people haven't seen, yeah. it will help, will help you break into the actual TCG market. Because the issue, I think a lot of the issues come down to if you look at Force of Will, it was a, popular for a while. But at the end of the day, it does play a lot like magic. Yeah. And I think that is part of its issue, is it does play a lot like that. But if you could release a game that is kind of basically re relatively new, you could still... I'm not saying it has to be completely original. You can borrow concepts from other games. Yeah. Because there's yeah. no... There's no... Shame no in, idea. Oh. yeah. Well, and there's also no shame in using a mana slash resource system in a game. Yeah, I kind of do because that. That like, is I... a that is a way to balance your game so people don't play top of the end curve cards at the beginning. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there's also other ways to go about doing it other than well, yeah. a mana resource. Because well, no, definitely, but. Um, like Sinfinite's game, uh, Cog to War is kind of a rework on the Yu Gi Oh system. That's kind of how mine is as well. I'm gonna be honest because mine uses offerings just like Yu Gi Oh essentially did, uh, at least in the old school version where that was like the only powerful card. So, yeah, that's yeah, uh, kind of the same concept. But there's no I'm... shame in taking a base concept and then playing with it a little bit, or yeah. even just taking a mana system. If you if your game has the Hearthstone mana system of plus one each turn, that's fine as long as you have some originality that doesn't make it yeah. just Hearthstone. Yeah, just a uh, straight up knockoff. Well, mine's like uh, Magic and Duel Masters. See, mine's um, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Duel Masters. with a twist. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, just making something completely original is, is decently difficult, especially now mm -hmm. that almost everything has done it, at it's least. Been thought of. <laughs> yeah, at least in some way, shape, or form. You can, you can find someone that claims their content is super original 
within an hour of a search, you you probably find something at least you know similar with the basic gameplay mechanic, yeah. especially when it's one individual genre, such as a trading card game. No matter if it's homemade or not, it's probably already been done, especially back in the day when everything had a card game. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that uh, uniqueness is important, but also that it's uh, sometimes overrated. That you need to have something unique, but some people go a little overboard yeah. and they'll rip you apart for having any similarity, and it's like, come on. Like, we got to base our games on the stuff that works. Yeah. And then, But you also want your game to offer something new, some, some reason that people are going to want to play your game over a different... Yeah, but cause... honestly, I think it returns to my what I was saying about people being game creators who are more passionate about like their artwork or game card design than they are game design, right? They come in, they don't, they don't really know it, but I don't think they want to make their own game. They want to just make cards. They want to just be popular on YouTube. They want to just throw out their pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, kind of why I think uh, uh, an open source street TCG would be fun because maybe those people would have something that they could, join in without having to feel like they have to try to make their own game. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. you do all the pretty much heavy lifting, they just make it look pretty. <laughs> so, or I, not I even pretty, it. just well, their yeah. own creative flair. Exactly. I, I I actually see it working, but it, like I said, the uh, balancing would be a lot on your end. Oh, yeah, loads of work. Yeah. So, yeah. but all it, it, all, it would be a little bit of a mess. Yeah. I had some, but I, I, I blanked out. Yeah, I did that a lot. <laughs> I sort of go silent for a while. <laughs> well, do y'all think now is a good time to conclude it? We've been been at it for about an hour and like two 25 hours. minutes. Yeah. Yeah, almost two yeah. hours. Yeah. I and I think that was a pretty good first, uh, first one. Yeah, Alrighty. Well, then I'll go ahead and end the stream. To everyone that, that's been watching, uh, I think we had a peak of five whole viewers. So that's exciting. I'm one of them. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> so potentially one other person was watching us. Um, we but, thank you. Yeah, to everyone that was watching either the YouTube or the live stream. Thank y'all. And I hope this was hope. I mean, somewhat informative. The whole point of this podcast is to try to, uh, help, you know, the whole HTCG community. Yeah. And we will be doing this every other Thursday, hopefully for the foreseeable future. So make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and also check out all of these wonderful people that have been a part of this uh, discussion to include Black and Chrono. All their links to the games, their channels, anything else will be in the description below, so check them out.